Hi, my name is Tim Rodolfi. I'm a colorectal surgeon at the Medical College of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. It's my pleasure to be presenting hemorrhoid management and best practices. I have no disclosures. As we all know, hemorrhoids are a very common problem. In fact, it's one of the most common health conditions searched on the internet, affecting approximately 4% of the U.S. population and accounting for over 3 million outpatient office visits per year at an estimated cost of $770 million. It's important to remember that hemorrhoids are part of normal anatomy. Hemorrhoids exist in three primary locations, left lateral, right anterior, and right posterior. They receive arterial info from the superior medial hemorrhoidal arteries, and hemorrhoids are classified as either internal or external based on their relationship to the dentate line. Internal hemorrhoids are graded based on the degree of prolapse. The grading system is useful clinically for characterizing the hemorrhoids and selecting appropriate treatments. Grade one hemorrhoids are visibly engorged, but do not prolapse below the dentate line. Grade two hemorrhoids prolapse below the dentate on Valsalva or defecation, but spontaneously reduce. Grade three hemorrhoids prolapse, but require manual reduction. And grade four are prolapsed and not reducible. Patients usually seek treatment once they begin to experience symptoms like bleeding, prolapse, or pain. Although a trial of fiber supplementation is almost never a bad idea, in the interest of time, today's presentation will focus on procedural intervention. These procedures can be grouped into office-based procedures, such as rubber band ligation and sclerotherapy, or operative-based therapies, such as excisional hemorrhoidectomy, stapled hemorrhoid apexy, and Doppler-guided hemorrhoidectomy. Rubber band ligation involves placement of a rubber band on the redundant mucosa of the hemorrhoid column above the dentate line. The strangulated tissue necrosis after five to seven days, leaving a small ulcer that eventually will scar. Bands can be placed with a suction or traction device, and banding in general has a, is very well tolerated and has a very low complication rate. One question that frequently arises is the safety of banding while on antiplatelet or systemic anticoagulation. In this 2004 retrospective study of 805 patients undergoing 2,114 rubber band ligations, post-procedure bleeding was noted in 25% of patients on warfarin, 7.5% of patients on aspirin or non-steroidals, and 2.9% of those without any anticoagulant. An additional 2018 study sought to evaluate the use of clopidogrel during rubber band ligation. 80 bands were placed on 41 patients taking clopidogrel, and 72 bands were placed on control patients. The authors found that there was no difference in bleeding complications. Of course, it is best to cease any anticoagulation prior to banding. However, this data supports safe banding in those who cannot discontinue aspirin or clopidogrel. Another office-based therapy is sclerotherapy. Sclerotherapy is the oldest technique for grade 1 to 3 hemorrhoids, having been first described in 1869. The procedure involves the injection of one to one and a half mLs of a sclerosing agent into the submucosal layer of the base of the engorged hemorrhoid. The sclerosing causes fibrosis and fixation of the hemorrhoid. The most common sclerosing agents are hypertonic saline and 5% phenol and oil. One of the advantages of sclerotherapy is that it's safe for patients on anticoagulation. Now on to operative-based procedures. First described in the early 1950s, the closed or Ferguson hemorrhoidectomy technique remains the most common operation for hemorrhoids in the United States. An elliptical skin incision is made dissecting the hemorrhoid tissue away from the sphincter complex. The dissection is carried out beyond the enlarged internal component, at which point the pedicle is suture ligated with absorbable suture and the hemorrhoid tissue amputated. The wound is closed in a running fashion. A few millimeters of the anal margin wound may be left open for drainage. Up to three columns may be excised using the technique. Care should always be taken to preserve bridges of viable skin and mucosa between excision sites to prevent stenosis. An alternative excisional approach is the opener Milligan Morgan technique. The excision is very similar to the closed technique. However, following suture ligation of the pedicle and amputation of the hemorrhoid bundle, the wounds are left open to heal by secondary intent. Again, up to three columns can be excised with the same caveat regarding preservation of viable bridges of skin and mucosa. But which technique is better? This 2016 meta-analysis tried to answer that question. 11 randomized controlled trials were included encompassing 1,326 patients. They thought, sought to evaluate the outcomes of pain, wound healing, bleeding, and operative time. The authors found the pain was less in the closed hemorrhoidectomy group, wound healing was faster in the closed group, and bleeding was less frequent in the closed group. As expected, operative time favored the open technique by about six minutes. Postoperative complications, hemorrhoid recurrence, and infectious complications were similar. Both the open and closed technique have been modified to include the use of alternative energy sources, such as the 
bipolar diathermy, or ultrasonic shears. A Cochrane review was completed to compare bipolar energy hemorrhoidectomy to standard excisional hemorrhoidectomy. 12 randomized controlled trials were included with a total of 1,142 patients. The authors demonstrated a reduced operative time, reduced pain, and faster return to work. The authors concluded that the use of bipolar energy technique was superior in terms of patient tolerance. Stapled hemorrhoidopexy, first developed in Italy, uses a circular stapling device to address circumferential internal hemorrhoids and create a mucosa-mucosa anastomosis. To perform the procedure, a translucent anoscope provided with the circular stapler is introduced transanally. After placing the anoscope, a purse string suture is placed in a circumferential manner into the submucosa, approximately two centimeters above the dentate line. That of the stapler is placed through the anoscope and into the rectum. The purse string is tied down around the shaft of the stapler. The stapler slowly closed while providing traction on the purse string. Once closed, the stapler is fired and then removed along with the excised tissue. But is this technique any better than excisional hemorrhoidectomy? Another Cochrane review was completed to compare stapled versus conventional hemorrhoidectomy. The authors included 22 trials and 1,097 patients. Main outcomes of interest were recurrence and need for further procedures. The authors found a higher recurrence rate in the stapled group, as well as an increased need for additional procedures, leading the authors to conclude that if hemorrhoid recurrence and prolapse are the most important clinical outcomes, then conventional excisional hemorrhoidectomy remains the gold standard in surgical treatment of internal hemorrhoids. Furthermore, serious complications have been reported with stapled hemorrhoidectomy. In this systematic review of 78 studies with 14,000 patients, a median complication rate of 16% was found, including four, excuse me, five documented mortalities. Another review of rectal perforations occurring with stapled hemorrhoidectomy identified 40 published cases between 2000 and 2009, with 35 patients requiring laparotomy and fecal diversion, and an additional four patient deaths. The severity of possible complications associated with stapled hemorrhoid apexy have tempered enthusiasm for some. Originally described in 1995, Doppler-guided hemorrhoid artery ligation uses an anoscope with a Doppler probe to identify each hemorrhoid artery. The artery is subsequently ligated and is followed by a suture mucopexy for patients with symptomatic prolapse. Potential benefits are the lack of tissue excision and less pain. The systematic review of the technique included 28 studies and 2,904 patients. The authors found a recurrence rate of 17.5%, a bleeding rate of 5%, and a re-intervention rate of 6%. A second 2006 meta-analysis of four trials and 316 patients demonstrated equivalence in complications, an increase in operative time, a decrease to return to normal activities, and equivalent recurrence. The authors concluded that both are equally effective techniques. However, hemorrhoid artery ligation is more expensive and time-consuming without robust long-term data. One of the most difficult aspects of hemorrhoid surgery is post-operative pain management. Post-operative pain management starts with setting realistic expectations with patients preoperatively. Recovery time is variable and procedure dependent with excisional procedures causing the most significant pain. Multimodal pain control is critical and includes minimizing discomfort, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, limited narcotic use, as well as the use of liposome bupivacaine when feasible. The most robust data regarding liposome bupivacaine comes from this 2012 trial in which 100 hemorrhoidectomy patients were randomized to bupivacaine injection or one of three doses of liposome bupivacaine. The authors demonstrated a 47% reduction in pain score, a 66% reduction in opioid consumption, and an 89% reduction in opioid-related adverse events when a 20cc dose or 266 milligram dose of liposome bupivacaine was administered. In conclusion, a multitude of options exist for the management of hemorrhoids and should be chosen based on patient and hemorrhoid characteristics. Banding can be accomplished safely for patients taking aspirin or clopidogrel when necessary. Excisional hemorrhoidectomy remains the gold standard. Hemorrhoid artery ligation is an appropriate alternative. However, long-term data are lacking. And the use of bipolar energy source and liposome bupivacaine for excisional hemorrhoidectomy appear to have significant advantages. Thank you for listening.